what is up everybody welcome back to another episode of nft pirates i've got one another toronto man's in the house i got uh london here the comic speculator on instagram you know a really big deal in the comic book community in toronto i actually just recently bought a comic from him uh he's got some you know crazy big time hitters uh a massive collection and he's a physical collecting guy so i was like you know we kind of chatted i bought something off him and we had this really great conversation and i said you know let's continue this man i gotta get you on my channel and like let's look at the parallels and the differences between digital and physical collecting so thanks for doing this absolutely yeah this is awesome thanks for setting it up yeah it's exciting man like i said you know we had such a good conversation and there was just so much overlap uh you know we were talking yeah. about first appearances yeah. we we're talking about all these different things so um are you into NFTs at all, or you've only been a, a comic guy? Um, primarily, primarily comics. Personally, I mean, I I, yeah. I know a little bit about the NFT stuff, and uh, you know, I came pretty close a couple times to dabbling in it. Um, I, you know, I went as far as downloading was it the, the VVAP app, or is that it was, yeah, exactly, yeah. 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 Um, I poked around. I saw a few buddies in my comic community circle, you know, that were talking about some things that they picked up that were comic related NFTs. Um, obviously, there was some interest there. Um, but I never pulled the trigger personally because it, for me, it was just like, you know, it was a whole other world to, to kind of dive into. And I was a little bit unsure if I really had done my research, if I knew enough about it, or if I was ready to really know, you know, where I was going to be heading with it. Same as like, you know, jumping down into to collecting Star Wars books, you know, like mm -hmm. there's a whole lore there. You really got to know, you got to know the characters, you got to kind of do your research and know the history there before you start collecting on that kind of stuff. So I kind of just stepped back a little bit. I said, you know what? I'm happy where I'm focusing. I don't want to jump down that yet. But, you know, who knows? Anything can happen in the future, right? Amazing. Yeah. And I think a lot of people, you know, think like you as well. And, um, you know, it makes sense, right? It is a whole new world. And it's just like me jumping into the physical side of things with comic books. Like, it's not easy to understand, you know, like what a first appearance, what book it's in, what a key issue is, what a one to 100 variant is. How do you get yeah. it? How do you sell it? You know, there's a lot of, like you said, it's unraveling a whole new kind of universe. Exactly. Um, but, you know, one thing that I love that we talked about was these first appearances. And one of the things that we use digitally is we always say we're only collecting first appearances. A lot of people, that's just part of their strategy. They only collect like, you know, the first appearance of a major uh, uh, character on the blockchain. And similar to what you told me is that you only collect first appearances of major characters in comic books, right? So that yeah, pretty accurate? Yeah, I, I, I kind of follow a similar strategy. I mean, listen, there's, there's no wrong way to collect. Everybody right. has their own way. People like to collect full runs of certain series. You know, maybe they collect uh, runs of a specific artist that they really love or appreciate, um, you know, certain types of covers, you know, whatever it might be. But for me personally, um, I like to focus mostly on key books, you know, first appearances, because those generally hold, you know, more of the long-term value down the road. Right. Right. And talking about that, you did a really good job of pulling off some of those uh, Miles Morales comics back in the day. <laughs> you want to tell us the story uh, about that? Yeah, yeah. That um, so so he obviously we know he's he's been around for a while now. Um, you know, I think he was, if I recall, he was introduced. I think somewhere around like 2011 or something around there. I can't recall, but when I heard about it, when the story broke, and it, I think it was actually in some you know major uh, you know news websites that there was this, you know, mixed race Spider-Man coming, half black, half Hispanic. Um, and I was like, okay, this is kind of interesting, you know? I mean, Spider-Man being one of the most popular characters in the Marvel world. I mean, literally, he is num number one in terms of popularity in the Marvel world. Um, you know, literally just next to, if we're talking all superheroes, it's like Batman and then Spider-Man is the most popular. So obviously, you know, um, hearing about this was kind of a big deal. And I thought all right, this might be a, a book to kind of think about buying or, or investing in. And uh, at the time, um, you know, they released a couple different issues. He came out in an issue called Alt, uh, sorry, uh, Ultimate Fallout number four, issue four was his first appearance. And at the time, there was um, a bunch of different covers. You know, there was a standard cover that you could buy that came in like a poly bag. Um, you know, you could buy um, uh, a second print. There was a couple second prints. Maybe you've seen these ones where he's unmasked. So and that. there's one, you know, where you can see his full head because on the regular cover, you didn't see his face. And then there was a one in 25 variant. And uh, at the time I said, well, you know what, I'll buy the one in 25 variant. You know, the nine eights at the time were like 
It was like 200 bucks Canadian. I said, yeah, all right, I'll buy one. <laughs> and I bought one and I held on to it. And I bought a few more raw copies at the time and I got those graded and I had a couple extra nine sixes. And one of them I got signed by Stanley at Fan Expo. And that was a nine six. And, and I ended up selling my extra copies because I was like, all right, it's not really moving at the moment. It's worth like, you know, four, five, six. I think the Stanley nine six I sold uh, to someone for $700 Canadian. Wow. Which at the time, you know, wasn't much. Now looking back, I think that was a really big regret. I probably should have held on. I should have held on to all of them, really. But um, fortunately, I kept the 9.8. Um, I have all the other, you know, covers in 9.8. In I bought those also when they were all really, really cheap. So I, I've kind of, you know, made it my thing um, was to try to collect all the different covers in 9.8. Right. And then last year was the final piece of the puzzle. There was a Mexican foil variant. Uh, a Le Mole, uh convention variant, which I, I got the final piece there. So, um, and then I think I mentioned as well that um, my mother actually ended up investing in comics and I helped, you know, take some money that wasn't doing so well on a GIC. And she said, hey, son, you know, you look like you know what you're doing with this comic thing. Here's some money, cash it out. Buy me a comic that you think might be worth some money in you know next few years. And I said, hey, this is probably the number one, you know, most valuable or most you know that could give you the biggest return in terms of modern comics today right um and so i took her money and i invested and i bought a, a second copy of the one in 25 variant so you know i've been holding on to it and um you know everybody kind of makes fun of it like your mom has this great old comic like i don't even have these books <laughs> your mom of all people has this insane great old comic and i'm like i know it's, it's wild it is wild wow what a cool story man i mean you're probably the first person actually that I've met that has the 125 and and so many people I know, like you said, like love that cover, right? And we actually have that same one on the app. I think it's there's 600 editions of it. Um, and I think it goes for about 1.2K, so about 1200 US right now. Um, but, you know, like I said, it's all kind of, you know, living up to these, these uh, physical ones. Yeah. And the conversation that we always have, and this is where, uh, you know, I really wanted to pick your brain is, you know, um, a lot of people say, well, are these just, you know, just another medium, right? That this now this character, Miles Morales, has been reprinted or in our case, reminted in. And is it just, you know, but is the real comic, the one that you have, is that really the holy grail? Or could we potentially see these digital ones, you know, go up in value? So there's there's kind of a mixed feelings about it. Some people will say, well, no, they're their facsimiles kind of thing. They're kind of reprints. Other people will say, well, no, this is, you know, shared IP and this, you know, may be going into a new kind of digital revolution. And, you know, you could, they have a lifetime permanence to them and all these different things. So there's a lot of like debates around it. And we, you know, and the thing is nobody really knows. We might not know for another 10 years to for see sure, if yeah. this holds up. Um, but do you have any thoughts around that at all? I mean, Again, it's it's only going to be my personal opinion. Yeah. But, um, you know, again, when it comes to even uh, you know graded books, there's a whole part of the community that is really against you know grading books. There's a whole part of the community that mm -hmm. that hates that that these grading companies that exist that hate the fact that there's people out there that are you know sending away graded comics, um, mm -hmm. and and you know there's a whole part of the community that just appreciates the old school style of just being able to pick a book up off the shelf reading it, enjoying the smell of the comic, you know, the pages, you know, that paper smell, and just that nostalgia factor of just reading a comic book, right, from from cover to cover. And um, I do that too. I mean, I'm not, I'm not solely in it for just, you know, graded comic books. I mean, I like to read them. I have digital copies as well. I have, you know, uh, trade paperbacks. Um, I have a, you know, small collection of, of graded comics. I'm kind of you know, enjoying all aspects of it. But mm -hmm. when it comes to the, the NFT thing, I mean, yeah, I can see a lot of people probably looking at that as, you know, well, it's, it's not the same. It's, it's, it's a digital version and it's even different from, from, you know, going on a Marvel unlimited app and, and reading a digital version there or me downloading a version and having it in a zip file. It's even different from that because, right. you know, you have it. And, and I mean, I have it because I've downloaded it, but you have it in a different way. Yeah. 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 I've got you. Okay. It's, it's it's tough, right? It is, and and how do, you, how do you put a value on that? Yeah, uh, but I I understand that there's a whole side of that market that exists, and there's a whole other side of of collectors that that appreciate those types of 
you know, digital valuables and collectibles. Um, but it's just right. never been anything where I could see my, I, I don't, at, the, at this point in time, I, I'm a little weary to go down that path because I don't know where it's going. And I mean, the general consensus, and again, your opinion will be different because I only see what I see on social media platforms like Reddit and, you know, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. and the general consensus is, at least from what I'm seeing, is that a lot of collectors or a lot of people don't really understand NFTs or don't like the fact that they exist. Right. Right. And again, that could change. I don't know. Maybe maybe that consensus will change. But for me, I'm scared to go down that path because it's like, you know, digital currency. Is it going to be here in, in 10, 15, yeah. 20 years? I don't know. Whereas comic books, you know, will they still exist in a physical form in 30 years or not? I, I don't know that either. But, you know, maybe that, that if it doesn't exist and they don't exist in the future, then maybe that makes the physical ones that we have now more valuable. Right. So it's a good point. Who knows? And, and man, so so thanks for kind of sharing all your insight there. And uh, I love what you said there, because, you know, I, I was talking to another comic book owner. Actually, you might know him, Steve from Comic Book Addiction and Whippy. Yeah, Whippy is a great store. Yeah, great store. So I, I know the owner well. I'm trying to get him on for an interview. I okay. keep, you know, so maybe if he sees this, he'll be like, <laughs> oh, well, you know, I see London's there. So, um, but yeah, I was talking with him and then he said the same thing as you. He's like, well, let's just say that they stop printing more, you know, physical books in the future. Then that would just exasperate the importance of these ones that are already out and that are already scarce. It's not like they can create more copies of AF15. So what is that going to do as we get more and more money in the space? And, you know, more and more digital goods are being produced and all the physical stuff starts to die off, then, you know, you would presume there's still going to be a big market that would want that physical, those physical items, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's true. So any chance we could see some of uh, some of your hitters? Did you bring anything here for us uh, today? Yeah, or? yeah, I'm happy to share. Yeah, I'm happy to share. So um, yeah. should I start with the Miles stuff or should I finish oh, yeah, with maybe. Miles? Yeah, so I'm a huge Miles fan, so maybe we'll, we'll leave Miles for the end. I we'll feel like that... the end. Okay, yeah. so uh, I'm sure I'll share. And, and and for any collectors that are out here watching, um, obviously they'll recognize a lot of these books. You might even recognize some of these yourself. Um, and this is the first one from the pile. So for anybody that can see this, wow. this is sort of if you can see it. So this is Spider-Man One from 1990. Um, <laughs> it's a Todd McFarlane cover. It's really a timeless cover. A lot of people know this artwork specifically. Wow. Um, the very one of the very first comics I bought as a kid was the gold version of this. So they printed this in different colors. There was like a silver, a gold, a colored. This one specifically, though, is the platinum. So there was a very, very scarce print run. It came with like a almost kind of like a personalized letter. Um, they're very hard to find, very hard to find in high grade. Um, this one is signed by Todd McFarlane, and uh, I'm happy to own it, obviously. Um, I picked it up a few years ago for a great price. Now it's worth quite a bit more than what I originally purchased it for. Um, so this is one I'm definitely, definitely happy to have that one. And people know on the channel, like everybody knows Todd McFarlane because we have oh, a lot of Todd McFarlane. So, so if, you, if you've ever heard of the character Spawn, um, yeah. he's the creator of Spawn. Um, most people know him from that. Um, he did a huge run on uh, Amazing Spider-Man in the 300 uh, issue 300 period so uh, the character venom for example was partly on one of partial his creation so a lot of people know amazing spider-man 300 being from you know todd mcfarlane in his days so um yeah he's, he's a great artist and uh, mm -hmm. a great writer as well so there's another classic Ooh. again this is one that a lot of people would know too um I love that book 252 it's you know the first one of the first issues where he had the black costume the symbiote costume which later then becomes venom um, this one, uh, interestingly is a newsstand and what that means is basically it's a little more rare because yeah. there was less newsstand copies, you know, newsstand because it has the barcode, um, other issues had like a, a little picture in the corner usually. And there's a lot of other issues as well around this period, around the eighties that came with this barcode to represent newsstand. But basically if you have one, it means it's a little bit more valuable. Now there was a period of time where nobody cared about this. And in fact, when I bought this. It was the same price as ones that weren't newsstand because there was a period where nobody cared and nobody appreciated these newsstand variants. So I have a few in my collection. I'm like, hey, I bought this for the same price as a you know a non-newsstand or whatever it was. And now I'm glad to, that I have them because now I feel like in some ways people are just looking for almost any little something to say, hey, this book's a little bit more valuable than your book, you know, whether whatever it is. So that's one beautiful of the that, that people care about. Um, so cool. Okay. Moving on, and this is the one I was referencing a few moments ago, which is uh, Amazing Spider-Man 300. 
the first appearance of Venom, which a lot of people know from the Tom Hardy movies. Um, this one I bought quite some time ago. I think I bought it for about 450 Canadian, actually, in the grade already, 9.8. Um, I gave it to an awesome company called Desert Wind Comics, who took the book that was already graded, distributed to a couple, a couple of different comic shows, and got it signed by uh, some of the greats, so Todd McFarlane, uh, David McLeany, um, uh, Stanley, um, and then it kept the grade, the 9.8 grade. At the time, I was still a bit of a rookie collector, so I didn't realize how big of a risk I was taking by cracking a 9.8 to get signed. Um, but it worked out in the end, and it kept the grade. So, I, again, this is a book I'm not letting go of. I'm happy to have it. Yeah. Wow. Uh, you know, that's another really awesome one. And I'll fly through some of these other ones here. Um, <laughs> Deadpool, a lot of people know who Deadpool is. Um, yeah. Signed by the artist, the creator of Deadpool, uh, Rob Liefeld, 9.8. Uh, another awesome book, and he's got another movie coming out, Part 3. A lot of people are pretty jacked up because he's coming into the Marvel Universe. If we're talking about Todd McFarlane again, um, this was a kind of almost like a previews type of a magazine. It kind of gave you like um, insight to upcoming issues. So this was Spawn before Spawn, the actual series was released. So this was kind of like a beta version or a preview of the character before he was released. Um, it's hard to find this one in high grade, hence the 9.6. I was a little bummed about it. But I got it signed by Todd, uh, also the creator, again, an artist. So I was pretty happy about that. Wow. Um, let's see who else we got. Um, a lot of people like this one. Um, it's a big <laughs> book. <laughs> first appearance of Wolverine. Uh, everybody knows who he is, also one of the most popular uh, characters in X-Men. Um, a long story behind this one, and it's really, it was really a journey um, to get this book, to be quite honest with you. Um, years ago, I started off with a raw copy which was uh, probably in and around an eight and a half, nine. And again, this was before it was really worth what it was worth today. And I think I spent about 600 bucks on that raw copy. And uh, I gave, again, I gave it to this, co this company, Desert Wind Comics, who sent it away. And it came back like a year later and it got signed by Stan Lee, John Romita. It got signed by a whole bunch of people. Len Wein, it had a, a little um, drawing of a, a Wendigo, like a sketch of a Wendigo on the cover. Um, I think it had four or five different uh, signatures. At the, at, if you had something like that today, it would be worth quite a bit of money. I didn't appreciate it, and I was really bummed out because Stan Lee, when he signed the book, he must have got a little bit of ink on the bottom of his palm, so it rubbed on the cover, and CGC you know, kind of destroyed the grade a little bit because of it. So it went from the kind of 8.5, 9-ish area to like a 7.5. I was bummed about the grade, sold it, flipped it for a 9.0, just a blue label, one that wasn't signed or anything. And then a couple of years later, went to Fan Expo, saw a 9.2 there. I said, hey, how much to take my nine and send it, you know, trade it up for your 9.2? The guy's like, I don't know, 400 bucks. I said, all right, let's do it. Went to the 9.2. And then that's where I stopped. And I was ready to kind of go up to the 9.4. So I sold it. Sold it to a guy for, I don't know what it was, a few thousand bucks at the time. And then that's when the that's when the character kind of like went nuts. The book popped. All of a sudden, it was impossible to buy that book back for what I had literally just sold it for. So I sold it the worst time, literally. And then one day, a buddy of mine is like, "Hey, uh, I see a guy here with a nine six. Why don't you uh, talk to him?" And I'm like, nine six. I'm like, that's out of my range, man. But that night, I had quite a few drinks, um, and I said, you know what? Fuck it. Let's just call the guy up. Message him on Instagram. Said, "Hey, man, I love your book. What can we do here?" This guy had like a collection that destroys my collection. He's got an insane. He, he, he did. Yeah, he was happy to let go of this. Let's just say, and uh, I traded him another really great Iron Man book uh, at the time. I traded him that with whatever I sold my nine point two for, and went straight to the nine point six. And I've been holding on to this since then. But uh, I do regret because at the time that I got this, a nine point eight was around twenty five thousand US, and. Uh, from what I've seen, they've been selling now for over 100,000 US, which is crazy for a 90. So at the time, I was like, uh, I don't know if I want to come up with an extra, you know, five or 10K. But now I regret not scrambling to find it because that would have been the better investment. Wow. Still an amazing accomplishment, though. Still an amazing book. Um, yeah. Giant Size X Men. A lot of people know this one as well. Um, let's see, a couple more here. Yeah, take your time, man. This is the fun part. I'm I'm just all I'm just yeah, jealous of Tyler. Sure, um, <laughs> These are just some of my, yeah, some of my favorite. Oh, dude. Oh, this one. This <laughs> That's is a 125, right? Yeah, the Greg Land variant. Um, you know, Spider Gwen, as people refer to her. 
You know, she's been in the Sony animated movies. Um, I feel like she's going to be coming to, you know, the Marvel Universe at some point, I'm going to assume. Um, a hard book to find. I bought this at the time. I thought it was overpriced. I bought a CBCS 9.8 copy, and I think it was for about 750 or 800 Canadian. Wow. And uh, I felt guilty about spending that money at the time. And uh, obviously, it's done nothing but go up, which is great. You know, very popular character. And then uh, actually, just very recently, I just turned it over to CGC. I said, crack it open. You know, let's see what we can do. Hopefully, it keeps the grade. And it kept the uh, the grade with CGC. And again, that's just because I know that CGC books, unfortunately, are worth a little bit more than CBCS on the market. You know, I'm not saying I, I don't think CBCS is a great company because I really think they are. But um, the market just has said, you know, CGC is worth a little bit more. So that's why I want to convert this over. Um, so also a book I'm happy to have. And now this is one of my very last uh, CBCS books in my collection, which is um, the first Avengers, uh, which is in a 6.0. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite books. And this one here I bought in, um, I bought a raw copy in maybe around 2011, 2012, bought the Fan Expo. It was like two or three hundred dollars. I raw copy. It was nothing at the time. I bought it. Got it signed by Stanley at Fan Expo. It came back, I think, like in a one and a half or two old grade. And I put it on Kijiji for fun just to see what people would, you know, offer me. I remember this one guy came. He wanted to see it. And he's like, man, this thing is worth nothing. I'll give you like 200 bucks for it. And I was like, yeah, I don't know about that. I held on to it a little bit longer. And it obviously started to see some value. And then um, I was able to straight trade that for a 5.0. Um, some years later, which was obviously a, a great uh, thing I was able to do. And then when I saw a six at Fan Expo, I moved up to a six. Now, um, my only complaint about this book, and this was just solely because I was still kind of a semi uh, rookie when it came to graded books. In, and I don't think you'd be able to pick this up on the camera, but uh, maybe you can a little bit. But in the top um, right corner here, there's a little bit of water damage. And I don't know if you can see that at all. It's kind of like. Yeah, I can see it actually. Yeah um and uh that's gonna obviously hurt the grade i wanted to convert it over to cgc but i don't think that um, cgc is going to treat water damage um the same as cbcs i think that's where they probably deal with things a little bit differently so i wanted to convert that over and i'm scared to do it because i'm afraid that if i do cgc might treat it much differently and maybe drop it quite significantly in grade so I'm keeping that one as is, and I'll decide what to do with it when, when the time comes. But um, that's a rookie mistake that I made on my part, and I really should have uh, not overlooked that because I saw it and I was like, yeah, I just looked at the grade. I just looked at the label. I was like, hey, 6.0, awesome, but didn't consider you know, some of the other things that I would have considered today if I had done something like that. Wow. Dude, I'm not gonna lie to you. I'm I'm just sitting here in complete jealousy. I'm just going like, yeah. It's like maybe I should just drop the NFTs and get into more comic collecting. I mean, those you are some what? big books, man. You know what? Um, it's it's um, and I'm sure the same goes for you. Like, it, it's not something that everybody can just get into overnight. Like, you got to do your research, and yeah. you really got to understand uh, the market. You got to be able to do things like on the comic side. You know, you want to learn how to. Be able to grade comics yourself you want to be able to look at a, a raw comic book and be able to kind of give it you know as close to an approximate grade as you can and that's important to be able to do because that saves you from getting ripped off right like you know you bought your you know your, your first issue the one in 200 variant behind yeah. you and maybe one day you want to send that off to cgc and get it graded but you want to know first is it a good idea should i even do it you know what what's the grade approximately and you want to be able to look at it and say okay, you know, here's some defects or be able to recognize what the defects are because in the long run, maybe you send that in and maybe it comes back a nine and you realize, oh shit, that was a waste of money. You know, now it's not worth, you know, whatever I thought it was going to be worth. And that's part of the learning of being a collector. And, and you got to be willing to really invest the time in researching, you know, reading online, you going on forums, you know, consulting other people that you know that are in the, the collectibles world and, and trying to get their information feedback. And I researched the shit out of this when I was starting off. And I wanted to know what all, you know, the top 100 most valuable comics were. I wanted to know, you know, how to grade comics. And I found a really great site that showed me examples of, every, of, of books in every single different grade. So wow. I could learn to, what to look for and all those things. And just over the years, I was able to kind of understand the world. And then I followed my own path in terms of what I felt would be, you know, what I wanted to collect and, and where I saw the value coming in. I kind of, 
you know, I kind of had a hunch on some of these newer, you know, modern characters and these ones that are like, again, of, of the di diverse ethnicities and so on, right? Like you have now, you know, Miss Marvel, Kamala Khan, you have the potential young Avengers coming, you know, you have all these younger characters that are kind of, you know, replacing these legacy characters. And I kind of felt years ago, I'm like, you know, what? I have a feeling that this is the direction it's going to go in. And I kind of, you know, started buying books that were of those types of, of, of those types of characters. And it worked out and it ended up, you know, those books became valuable. And, and, and I kind of, I guess I just kind of knew what I was doing. And uh, a lot of people doubted it. And, you know, especially the, the old school collectors and a lot of collectors don't still believe in modern books. And I totally get it. You know, a lot of people believe that the best stuff to buy is the old stuff. It's the golden age. It's the silver age. Um, you know, maybe a little bit of the copper stuff, you know, not so much the, the, the modern age, but I personally believe that the modern age is going to become at some point the silver age books, because as people like you and I grow up and get older and, you know, we have kids and our kids have kids, you know, it's going to be books like, you know, Miles Morales that are going to be the future of these characters. And maybe it's going to be our grandkids that are going to be like, Hey, Miles is, is my Spider-Man, you know, Peter Parker, right. yeah, I know him, but Miles is my Spider-Man. So, you know, that's just my own opinion. That's kind of how I did things. Amazing, man. And I share that same philosophy as you. That's how I kind of see the world going. And, you know, and I think that's why I'm still interested in NFTs, because I'm like, I know in 10 years from now, you know, we might be sitting here with augmented reality kind of in our spaces. And I'm showing you things that aren't even physically there, but you could see them in your periphery, right? It's like, yeah. so it's like, there, like you said, it's, it's important to think ahead. Yeah. And, you know, one story that I love that you shared with me, actually, when we met in person was the story of Miss Marvel. <laughs> Um, do you mind sharing that for everybody? That was a cool yeah, story. Yeah, that was um that was a cool one. So um I guess this was probably about a year or, or maybe two years after her uh first appearance in the comic books. Um again, you know, I, I'm just following a hunch that I had, you know, she's a Pakistani character, you know, again, Marvel pushing these these diverse characters, you know, female characters and so on. I'm like, you know, again, this might be somebody I, I want to invest in long term. And um, there was a guy that had uh, a copy of, again, this is for the collectors out there, Captain Marvel issue 17, the second print, which is known for her uh, being this, the first cover appearance of, of Miss Marvel. And um, he also had, he had that issue and he had Miss Marvel number one and the two of the more uh, rare variants. It was a sketch cover and then a, care, uh, a color character by, uh, I believe it was Adam Hughes. And he had all three issues, and I think he was asking for like 150 Canadian for all three issues. And at the time, I mean, it was probably worth about that much. So I was, you know, I was paying what it was, what I was expecting to pay. And I went there, and he had two issues of Captain Marvel 17 second print, which is actually, you know, now the most valuable, I think, of, of her books. Mm -hmm. And he had two of them. He's like, here, you just pick which one you want. And I obviously, I picked the one that I felt looked a little bit nicer. And I was happy to keep those three issues. And I paid, you know, somewhere again, around 125, 150 bucks for all three. Um, fast forward a few years down the road, um, probably somewhere in around 2016, we'll say. Um, I'm at the Fan Expo. Stanley's making his annual appearance. As I do every year, I get him to sign some books. So I had him sign that one along with my ultimate follow-up for one and 25 variant. At the time, I had uh, and also an amazing Spider-Man 129, which is the first appearance of Punisher. Those three books I had paid for uh, Stanley autographs to get done on those. Um, that day, I'm walking around with a plastic bag because I'm collecting all my swag from Fan Expo. I'm throwing T-shirts and whatever else people are giving away from their booths. And I had my comics, my, my my comics in there. And they're just in, you know, sleeves and backings. They're not in any kind of, like, nice cases or anything. And uh, I realized that, you know, as I'm stuffing stuff in there, my comics are just getting thrown around and getting mashed up in there. And I pulled the Miss Marvel one, and I'm like, oh, shit, I think this one's... Might have taken a little bit of damage in here. I'm a little, I got worried. I'm like, do I still want to get this thing signed? Anyway, I go through the whole lineup. And, and for anybody that knows that's gone a Stanley autograph, you're in line for a while. Um, you know, this is like an hour, two hour lineup, maybe even wow. more in some cases. So I'm enjoying my time in line. We're ordering pizzas. You know, we're, we're just, you know, kind of camping out. I get to the front. And again, uh, for anybody that's gotten autographs at a, at a convention, um, the people that take your book and handle your book are usually just kids. And they have no appreciation or understanding about the value of comic books. So as they're taking them from you, they're really just treating them like they're a, a flyer you got in your mailbox, you know. So 
I'm seeing them handle them like, oh, here we go. There's just a little, you know, a little extra damage on top of the damage that I already got from walking around all day with it, stuffing t-shirts in the bags. So I had no faith about what this thing would grade in the end. Anyway, fast forward for the time that CGC sends me back the books. And uh, that Captain Marvel book received a 9.8. And I was ecstatic because it had Stanley's <laughs> autograph on it. It had um, the Stanley um, uh, custom label as well. So there was yeah. a period of time when a CGC had labels with, with Stanley's face on it. Um, and then I held on to it for a while. And uh, as we you know, kind of got closer to um, the Marvel show coming out, then it started to really see some value. Um, I think blue label copies and 9.8 were selling, you know, kind of in and around the two to 3000 us, um, which is probably more than what they're seeing today. I'm going to assume, but again, that was, you know, quite a bit of money, um, a couple of years or about a year ago or so. And, uh, after doing a little bit of research, I realized that I had one of three copies, uh, in existence with Stanley's autograph. Um, I didn't realize it was that rare and it was pretty cool to, to know that I had that book. Uh, and on top of that, I actually had the only copy that existed with the Stanley label. Damn. Um, so knowing that, I knew I had, you know, kind of like a full house in my hand. And I knew that I had the ability to, if I wanted to, to throw it up on eBay and just be like, let's just see if anybody buys. Let's just throw a number to this book. And let's see if there's any collectors out there with deep pockets that would be willing to make an offer on it. So I threw it on eBay again, you know, the book selling for two to 3000 on average, I threw in there for 8,000 us because of the fact that I knew that it had the label with Stanley's face, because I knew that it was one of three signed by Stanley. And of course, at the time, the character is now heating up because her show's coming out. And, uh, I would say about a month or two after I had it on there, somebody bit and, um, it was a really big time collector, a guy with some deep pockets really really nice guy uh from the burlington area and um he he, he was happy to take it for eight thousand us and it was really hard to sell it but at the same time i knew that i would have been really dumb if i didn't sell it so mm -hmm. i had to accept the offer and uh i was very happy to go out there and deliver it to him in person i'm not gonna lie i was pretty nervous about the whole transaction because i'm in a parking lot you know i told a couple of friends about it like, hey, just so you know, if you don't hear from me, you know, like this is the address. I'm sending my address to people because this is probably the biggest like in cash transaction that I've, I've ever had for mm -hmm. a comic at this point. Um, and the guy that showed up was, again, super nice. Uh, we spent a little bit of time kind of talking about some of the stuff that he had and his collection was like it just made my, made mine look like a, a rookie collection in comparison. Wow. You know, he was talking. He's got multiple copies of Amazing Fantasy 15. You know, first appearance of Spider-Man and some like an insanely high grade. Like we're talking like, you know, probably close to a million dollar value in some of these books. Jeez. Um, he had, you know, he had multiple copies of like X-Men one, like all the big, all the biggest books he had. And he bought them all from when he was younger. And, oh. and, you know, he probably paid, you know, he probably paid uh cover price for these off the shelf. He had a box of ama um, amazing Spider-Man 300 is the first appearance of Venom. He said he had a whole, box of them that he bought from the comic store cover price and then he had recently gotten them all graded and started i'm like that's a fortune that he would have just made off of that because wow. and he was kind of just like hey you know what man if you ever got anything else uh, that you just want to liquidate just let me know i'm happy just to grab it off you and i'm like all right <laughs> so you know this guy i don't know for all i know he could have just retired 10 years ago and whatever money he's got is just from you know whatever he's done in his comic collecting days so you know unfortunately it's it's a bit of a bias um industry in terms of if you got in you know years ago or if you got in when these books came out or, or fresh um i mean you have an unfair advantage uh oh, yeah. you know like one of my close friends um he got into comics uh, a few years ago and he started from scratch and i'm thinking man this is like the worst time to get into comics because now everything's peaked it's covid um you know everything's sky sky high in terms of prices and stuff but he was adamant. He did all of his research. He, he figured it all out. He knew, he, like, I'm not, he used me quite a bit. Like, you know, every day we're messaging and he's like, hey, man, what do you think of this? Hey, help me understand this. Like, I was a big resource, obviously, when he started off. And he even gifted me a couple of things because he knew that he was taking up a lot of my time and, you know, that he was really tapping me for a lot of information. But, you know, he's exceeded me in some ways in terms of, like, he's, he's gone the extra mile. I'm lazy. You know, I'm very uh, calculated about my purchases. You know about what i buy what i invest in 
And, uh, you know, he's out there, he's literally hitting up, um, you know, yard sales and flea markets. And, Jeez. you know, he's, he's on the Facebook marketplace, you know, diving through stuff. He, you know, he'll dive through the dollar bins. He does all that. I don't even go that far. I'm not saying that you shouldn't like a true collector will go to that extent to find, you know, gems and treasures and hidden deals and stuff. I'm just lazy in that way. I don't, I don't go to that extent and I probably would find a lot of really cool stuff, but he's built such an amazing collection in such a short period of time. And the stuff that he has, I'm like, I'm still mind blown. Sometimes he'll show me some things. He's like, Hey, wow. uh, what do you think of this? And I'll, and I'll be like, that's amazing. And they're like, Oh yeah, I got it for like, you know, next to nothing. I'm like, what the guy didn't drug money. Like, how did you get, how'd you get it for that price? Yeah, right? but That's what he's doing. And uh, I applaud him. So if you're persistent and you, and you take the time to invest in researching and understanding and, you know, learning all the important things, you can do it. But for sure, if you got into this, you know, this market years ago, you're going to have an advantage for sure. Right. Wow, man. What a brilliant story. I mean, it's just so cool listening to you <laughs> with all that stuff. And there's some massive ROI in comic book collecting. And I think that's similar with NFTs. Like we had the huge peak, you know, during the, the height of COVID, I think it was like February 2022 was like the absolute peak. And then since there, it's just crashed, like we're almost like a 10x even 15 X reduction and, uh, and a lot of things. And I think, you know, you said to me earlier, it was like, sometimes books are like about two grand or you can pick up for, you know, 500 bucks now. Um, but one thing that didn't recede is, uh, your UF four, uh, 125. So do you have that on you today or no? Is that yeah, somewhere? Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I got, uh, I brought, oh, shit. I brought a few of these. So I brought my favorite miles ones. And again, like I mentioned, I've, I've been really kind of, I've been focusing a little bit more on him. And again, because, you know, again, we're talking most popular, you know, comic book character on the Marvel side, it's, it's Spider-Man without a doubt. Um, you know, Miles being the kind of future of Spider-Man and being that he's a modern character and being that when you look at modern books, the prices to obtain majority of modern books are night and day versus collecting the Peter Parker, you know, alternative from the 60s, you know, collecting, you know, uh, first appearances of some of the old school villains like you know, Sandman, Lizard, uh, Dr. Octopus, Vulture, some of these that you're going to be paying serious dollars to buy high grade copies of these books. Whereas, you know, if we're looking at the Miles side, he's still relatively new. And a lot of those books for some of the first appearance of some of his characters that appeared in his books are still relatively cheap. So if I can buy a first appearance of a villain, you know, from the Miles Morales universe for 150 bucks or 300 bucks or 400 bucks, then to me, it seems like a no brainer. Why wouldn't I do that? Because maybe in, you know, 30 years or 40 or whatever it is, maybe that book won't be worth three or four. And maybe now it'll be worth, you know, seven, 8,000, who knows, whatever, whatever it might be worth. Right? right. So it's to me, that's a no brainer. So um, I'll start with, I'll work my way up. Yeah. I like that. I like that style. That's good. Do that. <laughs> Smart. So we'll start here. So um, this is, uh, Ultimate Spider-Man. So it's the first kind of issue of his, his first solo issue. And um, for anybody who knows, it's kind of like the origin. This follows Ultimate Follow 4. So this is immediately after Miles is introduced. Now he's in his own issue. And that's the standard copy. This one came in a poly bag. Um, I had a poly bag. Actually, I had a bunch of them. And I gave some of, the way, some of them away to my, some of my friends. Like, I was a nice guy. Um, the one I kept, I opened up, I think, last year with a pair of scissors just for fun. And sent it away it came back nine six i was a little bit sad so oh, i sold okay. the nine six paid the difference and and got myself a nine eight um this book speaking of which has come down a lot and uh for anybody that's thinking about this book now is definitely the time to uh to get into it because it's at probably its record low that's been at for for the most recent few years anyways wow what what is that like about a k like 1500 now or? um that's a great question so i'll tell you exactly what it's worth so right yeah. now it's worth about six hundred and fifty dollars U.S. Damn, which is so actually really good. Um, because I would say last year they were going, you know, probably twelve hundred, thirteen hundred U.S. Right. So it dropped about fifteen, about fifty percent, which is a huge drop. And again, great for someone that hasn't already bought. Um, I think there's probably people that even bought uh, beyond two thousand. I think it, I think it peaked in and around two thousand at one point. Wow. So that's a huge drop. Bad for anybody that bought in at 2000 but great again for anybody that didn't. Right. Um, next is the same book, but this is the 1 in 15 variant, so the unmasked version. It's actually my favorite cover, to be honest. So um, cool. Really cool cover, really hard to find. Um, believe it or not, 
there actually is a sketch version. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's a black and it's white. Like black and white. So not a lot of people even know that book exists. I yeah. know that book exists because I remember seeing it on eBay years ago. And I think they say there's like maybe 10 copies or something ridiculous like that that exist. And I remember seeing one ages ago, right around when this book came out, there was a 9-8 on eBay. And the guy wanted something like 1500 or something for it. And I'm like, you're out of your mind. Like, who's paying $1,500 for a book that just came out. Oh man, if for anybody that's got that book now, you're laughing because again, if, if there's literally 10 of them that exist, you can ask for whatever you want for it. Like literally whatever you want. It's, it's It really would be the most rare uh, Miles book that exists. Crazy. Yeah, there's um, no data on it, right? I saw, I was looking yeah, and I couldn't you, see. You can't really, yeah. There's no sales data. Right. I don't even know if it's in the CGC uh, registry in the census. I don't even know if that exists, but wow. um, this is again, the same book. But this, now this is the one in 30 variant. Wow. So, again, this is the hardest one to find of the issue number one. Um, I had I had this also. I, at the time, I bought a set, uh, a raw set. So they gave me all two or three books. Um, this wasn't my original copy. I sold my original copy. It came back 9.6. But at the time, I used the difference to, to upgrade to a 9.8. Um, but yeah, if you're buying this book today, you could be spending, you know, three or 4,000 US now to buy this book. Crazy. Moving on to Ultimate Fallout 4. Um, I'll start with, uh, yeah, I'll start with the lowest one here. So this is the cheapest one to buy. Um, this is the second print. Um, or what? There's actually two second prints. This is one of them, the unmasked second print. Actually, I love this cover. This is uh, artwork that actually appears, I think, towards the end of the actual book itself. Um, I bought this for $65. I thought it was a no-brainer. Um, but even then, if you bought it today, it's still probably only going to be, you know, maybe $250 US, which is still not that much. And for anybody that doesn't own any copy of Ultimate Fallout 4, I say, why not? Just fucking buy it. $250, you can't go wrong. When the character comes out on the big screen, Maybe it's doubling. Maybe it's worth 500 bucks. It's, it's an easy investment, right? So my opinion, I would pick one of these up if you don't have any copy. Great point. Moving on to the next one. This is the second print. And again, it's the same thing as the one I just showed you, except it's a different artwork. Um, the standard print doesn't show his face in the top here. So it's like kind of cut off. Um, this one's worth a little bit more. I think you're looking at like, I don't know, 350-ish, we'll say somewhere, yeah, about 350 US for this one. Uh, if you have the extra money, if you have the extra 100 bucks to spend, I mean, buy it. Why not? Yeah. Nice so, cover. Yeah. Um, and then this one here is a foil cover, which maybe, you, I don't know if you can pick that up. It's kind of metallic. Yeah, I haven't seen that. That's sick. It's pretty cool. Um, actually, I overpaid for this one at the time. Um, yeah, it was a mistake. Uh, not a mistake. I was happy to buy it. But again, I never predicted that the market would have taken a dip this year. So I probably spent, uh, you know, more than what you can get for it now. Um, you know, now you can probably get this one for about, I don't know, maybe 350 to 400, somewhere in and around there. U.S. It's still a very cool cover. I love the fact that it's metallic. Um, a lot of these uh, Mexican, you know, comic conventions have been releasing a lot of these foil uh, reprints of a lot of these original books. Um, I've actually been buying a few of them recently. Spider-Man 1, 1990, um, ASM 300, the first Venom, there's a foil version of that. Hulk 181, now there's a, a Mexican foil version of that. I love that. I'm, I don't know. I'm buying into all this foil stuff. I love it. Cool. Uh, so I think that's a really cool book. Uh, moving on to the, this is the original first print. Um, and for some people, this is kind of a big gun. Um, you know, it, it's a book that a lot of people want to have, obviously. You know, you're looking at, uh, you know, probably about about 1900 2000 today's market to buy one. Um, it dipped as low as probably 1700 recently. If you could have bought one for, if you bought one for 17, I'd say you're you're good. Um, I know these might have even peaked 3K at one point um, during the height of COVID. So again, if you have the money, a first print is probably the best way to go. Um, you're guaranteed to make a return on this book. Again, he's coming out in the next few years. I, I know 100%. They've teased him in so many ways. If anybody saw that Spider-Man movie with uh, Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield, did you see that one? For sure. Great um, movie. 
I mean, Jamie Foxx even said, hey, there's got to be a black Spider-Man out there somewhere, <laughs> right? So you know it's going to happen. You know it's coming. Um, if, again, it's a, it's a no-brainer. And moving on to what you really want to see here. Um, these are the uh, the Dejurovic. I always have a hard time saying his name. So that's why I, refer, I always say the one in 25. <laughs> you say <laughs> it. <laughs> It's like it fools me every time, but wow. um, these are these are great books. Um, this is my copy I bought way back for two hundred Canadian. <laughs> and now, what's uh, that worth now? Uh, so they've been selling for I think there was a there was a couple sales uh, around in around forty two thousand US. Um, if you go online, I think the fair market value today is about forty k US. Um, obviously this, this was a great investment. I never would have thought that my most valuable book in my collection would have been this one of all books. Um, but again, I'm happy to have it and it would be in my collection regardless, uh, of what it's worth today, because I love the character. Um, I love the artwork. It's, it's a timeless book. Um, and then moving on to my mom's copy, because we were talking a little bit earlier. Um, this is her <laughs> copy. So, you know, it's kind of cool. Um, and, and we're holding on. I'm holding on to this for her, for, for safekeeping. Yeah. And like I said, she'll check in every once in a while and say, hey, son, how's it doing? I'm like, hey, mom, I just broke another sales record. And she's <laughs> like, all right, smiley face emoji. And, um, you know, it, it's it's cool. It's cool that, um, you know, she trusted me to to make that investment for her. And, um, you know, for anybody out there that, that also has one, congrats to you. Uh, hopefully you didn't pay 40K for it. But, okay. um, if you have one, you know, awesome. Even in any grade, really. If you have it in any grade, that's it's it's pretty cool. It's a hard book to find. Wow, man. I mean, just seeing those covers. That's the first time I've actually seen it. Even though it's uh, we're we're you know virtual right now, it's the first time I've actually uh, had another person that I've communicated with it. So it's pretty impressive. Uh, any chance I can actually get you holding up the two of them, just so yeah. that I'm gonna use this as the thumbnail. Yeah, I don't know if um. I don't know how the there lighting is here, but yeah, uh, it's a little glary, but I can still see it. There we go. How, how was how was that? That's solid. That's solid there. Yeah. Nice, bro. Cool. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, I mean, it's so funny. Like, you know, when it's interesting. I, I always say this, but there's so many people that don't like to the comic book investing, they don't like NFTs, they don't like all these things that are more speculative but have a higher kind of risk reward ratio. And, you know, I just think about like mutual funds and your mom's GIC, you know, where would that GIC be today, right? Like maybe another like 1.5x from where when she bought it. So it's like, you know, these, these are really um, sound investments for the, for the most part, right? I mean, there, there seems to be a pretty big ROI. And one thing that we talked about before was like, you know, buying these things when they're low, like speculating on them when it's not a lot of money instead of buying in once they're already at their ATH, yeah. you know, like would you today buy that book if you saw it for like let's say thirty five thousand, and if you didn't have it or would that be just too big of a risk in your opinion if it was my only thirty five thousand, if that was yeah. the only thirty five thousand, if my bank um balance was thirty five thousand, i probably yeah. wouldn't do it i would diversify right. to be quite honest i would um however if i had thirty five thousand and i would have no regrets spending that um and i wouldn't miss that money absolutely i would hundred percent I would buy it. Right, 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 right. And you know, what's interesting too, is like, you know, you talked about, you know, is it almost better to kind of liquidate the two UF4s, the 125s, get that 80K, reinvest into a bunch of new comics. And this is a conversation that we have because on VV, we have that kind of same kind of, you know, uh, thing as well. Like in the height, I think I told you the Spider-Man secret rare, the Marvel one secret rare, uh, you know, they both hit over a hundred thousand US. Um, now, mind you, at the time, you could probably only get about half of it if you traded it off the app. And if you just waited, you could have had that full that full amount of money. But what we're saying is they're hard to liquidate. Right. And and so it's hard to kind of get rid of it. But you probably would have had a better ROI if you had reinvested into all these smaller things that are easier to sell. You're right. Yeah, it's true. Right. So what uh, do you think? Yeah, no, I 100 percent agree with you. Yeah. Um, you know, I've I've toyed with the idea of do I just sell everything and buy myself an amazing fantasy 15, you know, like a mid grade copy and just, mm -hmm. just to have the Holy grail of grails, you know, on, on the Marvel comics and just to say that I have it, but while it would be, you know, amazing to say that I, I own such an amazing, you know, nostalgic book, you're almost better off spreading out, like you said, spreading out the money in other ways and try to diversify your portfolio 
and I'm sure a lot of people believe in this, whether it's stocks, funds, you know, whatever it might be, NFTs, you probably want to keep that same kind of concept. And when I sold that, that Miss Marvel book, that's what I did. I diversified. And one of the books that I bought was that that first, um, you know, that first Spider-Man book I showed you, that Todd McFarlane one, that platinum mm -hmm. cover, that one from 1990. Because at the time, I got a I got a great deal on it, and it's gone up, you know, five or six times the value. And and if I if I hadn't done that, I wouldn't own the book, right? If I, so that was the first thing I did. As I diversified, I bought a bunch of stuff, and some stuff obviously hasn't done as great or performed as well. But a few things that I made with with that return did actually make some value. So I think it's better, in my opinion, to kind of spread it out a little bit, diversify it. Um, you know, don't keep everything in one bucket mm. because anything else can kind of move a little bit. Right. Great points, man. And I think that's where also like the social capital element comes in because then other people will be like, oh, well, you know, just for the two UF4 125s, people are like, oh, you know, London's the man. I know he's got these huge books. And, you know, you come on my channel today and I could, you know, be like, man, look at this guy. He's got these two of the greatest books and the and for Miles Morales out there. Um, and so, like, you know, the the piece that people are thinking about, too, for some of these bigger assets through NFTs is like, you know, I don't know if you've seen like the whole tr thing with Bored Apes, but some of these guys would have like 100,000 followers on Twitter just for having a Bored Ape, just because they have this, I, you know, this nft that at the all-time high was worth a million bucks so everybody wanted to follow them because they were either smart or rich really right yeah. and so and so it builds this social capital and so i think that's the the thing that with nfts because they're so uh integrated within like the digital piece that a lot of people are using them for that but i think in terms of being logical it is smart to continue to reinvest and you know take those profits and reinvest but i think there's still a big run to be made on Miles Morales, you know, I, I'm really what, like you said to me, I think he is the next gen Spider Man. I think it really appeals to a lot of younger people. There isn't enough diversity, and for superheroes, um, you know, there's what much more inclusive languaging now, much more yeah. inclusive kind of understanding of how this world operates. So I feel like it is, it's going to be a big deal. So I, I feel like you're still holding because you think there's still some room there, if I'm not wrong. 100%. I mean, you know, uh, Sony's got a PlayStation game you know, now on, on Miles Morales, um, that's yeah. got to say a lot, you know, you got the Sony, um, you know, into the spider verse, uh, animated movie. And, uh, the first one actually exceeded my expectations. I thought it was amazing. Um, now you have the sequel coming out and there's a, a, a third one coming out as well. So, I mean, his popularity is, is gaining a lot of traction. Um, you know, I, and I, really if, if you were a non-collector and you said, Hey, I know you've been doing, you know, decent in your comic book stuff. If you were to recommend one comic book for me to buy today, and I got a thousand bucks or fifteen hundred bucks or whatever it is, what book would it be? I'm not going to lie. I would probably say the book that I think that you have the best chance of of getting a quick and you know return on your investment is going to be a copy of Ultimate Fallout Four. That's the book that I would recommend. I'm sure a lot of people would disagree. I'm sure there's collectors out there that say you're ridiculous. The fact that you would even suggest a modern book or a Miles book or whatever, but I'm going to be honest with you. That's the book where I see, you know, it's 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 a modern grail, really, is what it is. Um, you know, the first appearance of Spider-Man was Amazing Fantasy. Ultimate Follow is is the modern version of that book. And you know, you're again, we're talking Spider-Man, the most popular character, you know, in Marvel Comics, and Miles, you know, kind of following that. So I think that's really, you know, if you're gonna buy, if you're gonna own one comic book in the world. <laughs> and yet, you know, it's, it's, you got a thousand bucks, you got 15 bucks, 1500 bucks. I say, buy a copy of ultimate follow in the highest grade that you can and just hold on to it. Fuck man. I love that, dude, <laughs> man. I'm not going to lie to you. Like I, I wish, you know, so here's, here's, I guess one of the downsides of NFTs is you got this great collection. I've got a little collection here of things in the background, but I, you know, I love the it, NFTs, you got some great books back. <laughs> yeah. But I can't show you some of the badass things I can show you on my phone and be like, Hey, you know, look at this, but that, that's the limitation of, of you know, digital of collectibles at, at this current yeah. point in time. I mean, I could show you virtually and things, but, but you know, it, it is, it is cool to see, you know, what you just showed me there. And we could do things like augmented reality, but you know, the next version is what we're hoping for is like, I could get you to put on an Oculus or yeah, I could get you. To... I, actually, I actually have an Oculus. Oh, there we so, go. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. So this, so this would be kind of cool. So this is where I could show off next time. 
is we'll get you both on the Oculus. They're creating this thing called the Viviverse, which is like a metaverse where you yeah. can store all your digital collectibles in your mansion and stuff like that. So you and I could go on there and kind of explore around that way, but it's still a ways off. So we're in this weird in between phase right now, man. <laughs> I know what you mean, man. Like I, I invested in uh, virtual reality like from the get go. So nice. You know, I was uh, I bought the first you know uh, Oculus, the main first mainstream Oculus headset rip. You know, the Rift Oculus Rift I bought. The second iteration, I know now they have the mobile versions that no longer required for you to be tethered in. Um, I'm a believer in, in virtual reality because I've experienced it. I know it's like it's next level. It is so immersive. And when you're playing games in there, you can be lost in there for hours. It's like I'm a gamer myself. So I, I right. you know, I dabble in this stuff. So I understand it. But I think that it still has a little bit ways to go, obviously, to kind of become more mainstream because there's a lot of people out there that haven't tried virtual reality. So they don't really know what they're missing. But I right. think that it becomes more mainstream uh, and continues to blow people's minds, then then it'll become bigger than it is. Well said, man. Well, London, listen, man, I want to thank you so much for, you know, coming on today. That's awesome. Uh, man. It's awesome. Man, it's, it's like it was so much fun just like, you know, going through your collection, um, you know, some big books, some really cool books. I mean, I, I feel like if I can embody one collection that I'd want, it'd be yours. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, so I'll live I'll live through you for now um but you know it was, a, it was a great chat and uh like i said before everybody if you, you know if you don't follow uh london it's the comic so it's the dot comic dot speculator on instagram i'll have his link in the description um just a good for, guy for you guys to follow because he obviously understands not only comic books but you know physical collecting principles and you know roi and all these different things so and then he also sells uh you know comics in toronto so if you're a local person um, you know, who's like kind of looking to learn more, who wants to invest. I mean, he gave me a, an amazing deal on, on the green book in the background there. Um, and so, yeah, man, I really appreciate you, you know, coming all, on the show today and sharing your knowledge with everybody. Absolutely. It was a pleasure. Uh, I had a blast. Um, you know, anytime I'm happy to be here. I always like shooting the shit on this kind of stuff. So, you know, it's my jam. So always around. Awesome. Thanks a lot, boss. We'll see. Uh, get you on again soon. Absolutely.